so we're going to continue on with, uh, with, with thermal freeze-out today. And I'll come back to in a second. But um, I, I want to make a, a couple of announcements. The, the first is that um, your first homework is posted. Um, I guess it's, it's due, normally it would be due in a week. Um, Friday of next week is a, oh. uh, is a holiday. So the lab's closed. So nominally, I, I've made it due on Thursday. Um, you might be able to ne negotiate with, with Tibra, but um, <coughs> technically it's, it's due on, on Thursday. I tried to make it not too, not too heavy um, to, to, to minimize your, your, your excuses to ask for extensions. Um, the, the other thing is I, I've heard through the grapevine that it's a certain somebody's birthday. <clears throat> uh, so, um, I'll, 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 happy birthday to whoever it might be, and I'll let you figure it out. Um, okay, so, 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 so back to... Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so, 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 so back to dark matter. Um, we want to solve this equation, and th 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 this is kind of our, our master equation for thermal freeze-out. Um, this is the change in time of the number density of our dark matter particle. This term describes the dilution from the expansion of the universe, and this term describes um, annihilations, so reactions that change uh, the, the number of dark matter particles. So it gets contributions from things like dark matter, dark matter, annihilating to standard model, standard model, uh, but also the re reverse reaction. And the point is that if this term is big, it drives the number density to the equilibrium value. That's, if you like, an attractor solution uh, to the system. And what we expect to happen qualitatively is that we're going to start off um, tracking equilibrium. So we, we assume the dark matter particle is, is equilibrated with the plasma. It starts off by tracking equilibrium. And then the equilibrium density, as the temperature falls below the mass, starts falling off. But instead of just tracking the equilibrium distribution down and falling off exponentially, at some point, this term effectively shuts off. And I'm just left with um, the dark matter effectively stops annihilating and then just dilutes with the expansion of the plasma, and that corresponds to, to this flattening out here. So we're going to compute this approximately. Um, the way it's done in practice is, is, is people sit down and just compute it numerically, but it's, it's, it's handy to think a little bit about how uh, one might approximate this, and along the way we'll, we'll, we'll derive a couple of useful approximate formulas that are a handy rule of thumb to get an idea, just to, to make quick estimates. If you start with a theory, what's the dark matter density that it predicts? All right, so the first thing we want to do is clean up this, this left-hand side. And the left-hand side cleans up nicely if we define something called the yield, which um, I write as, as, as y, which is um, n chi over s. And here, s is um, s over a cubed. So s, big S, is the total amount of entropy in a volume a cubed. So S, big S divided by A cubed is little s is the entropy density. And the entropy and the entropy, entropy density are useful because unless something weird happens to um, inject entropy into the universe, this big S is constant. So roughly, if nothing weird happens, you can assume that big S is, is a constant. And that means that little s just goes like a to the minus 3. So this will be useful because if we divide n chi by, by the entropy density, that's basically the same thing we did here, multiplying the, the number density by a cubed, which gives us nice, nice flat behavior here and here. So dividing off by s, it, dividing off by little s is going to make things cleaner. And the expression for little s in terms of the cosmological plasma is 2 pi squared over 45 g star s t cubed. And this g star s is essentially a count of the total number of relativistic degrees of freedom. And roughly, g sub s is the sum over all the, all the equilibrated particles in, in, in your plasma. And th there'll be a, um, sorry, there'll be a, a sum over bosons. So b stands for bosons. And here you have the number of degrees of freedom of the given boson particle. Um, you multiply by the temperature of that boson, 
divided by the, the total temperature of the plasma, which, we cor which corresponds to the, um, the temperature of the photons, and then you put in a step function of, um, so I have a contribution from bosons, and the step function here means that the, the bosonic species, again, this is only approximation, but the bosonic species only contributes to the entropy if the temperature is larger than its mass. And the reason for that is as the temperature falls below the mass of a particle, the density of that particle becomes much smaller than the thermal density, than, than, than the relativistic density, and it effectively doesn't contribute to, to the entropy, to a good approximation. So this is, this is a contribution from bosons, and the contribution from fermions has the same form, except there's an extra three quarters. And this, um, the, the TB and the TF allow for the fact that certain species might have slightly different temperatures um, than, than, than the photon temperature. But very roughly, um, to, to a pretty good approximation, except for fairly late for neutrinos, um, this G star S, you can think of it as just a sum over all the degrees of freedom of all the particles that are lighter than, lighter than the temperature. So basically, a sum of the degrees of freedom of all the relativistic species. So this G star S is almost the same as the G star you define for radiation with a, with a small quark. Yes? Uh, how, how do you compute T? What, what, what do you use to define the temperature? That is, because every, every, every species has their own temperature, so what do you consider as the Yeah, so, well, so, 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 so for any species that's in um, kinetic equilibrium, we'll have the same temperature. Mm -hmm. And you might have other species that have different effective temperatures. And the way you usually get at those, and one example is neutrino, um, is that, is it, well, you have to track the cosmological history. So what ends, what ends, up, what ends up happening for neutrinos is um, neutrinos start off being equilibrated with the rest of the standard model particles. But the neutrinos only interact with the rest of the standard model through weak interactions. And it turns out that for neutrinos, as the temperature of the plasma falls below about a GeV, the weak interactions become too slow to keep the neutrinos in equilibrium. No, no I'm referring to like, so, you, so big T will be the temperature of the plasma? Yes. Okay. Oh, that's all you wanted to know. Yeah, and, and, and because TB are the baryons that which will be like most of the plasma? Well, <coughs> yeah, so, 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 so if, 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 if well, so this, this stands for bosons. Uh -huh. And if the bosons are in thermodynamic equilibrium, that means that, um, TB is equal to T, so, so you just get one. But for example, it, happen, it, it so happens that fairly late on, the neutrinos actually decouple from the photons at about a GeV, and they actually end up developing a slightly different effective temperature than photons uh, today. So these factors account for that. But for, 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 most of what we're, for most of what we're going to do, you can just think of this as a sum over all the degrees of freedom of light particles. Okay, in any case, I, I have this entropy. And I know that the entropy, because this thing I'm going to assume is constant, which it is constant unless something weird happens, because this thing, because this little s is now proportional to a constant divided by a cubed. Um, this thing looks like uh, n chi times a cubed. And that means that we can simplify the left-hand side of the equation. So we have that. We also have that, um, remember, h squared is a dot over a squared, and during radiation, this corresponds to just one over two t. And by the uh, by, 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 by our Friedman equation, this is also given by um, during radiation do domination, just the energy density in um, just the just the energy density in radiation t to the fourth times one over m Planck squared. So remember, your Friedman equation is just h squared is equal to, the equal to the total energy density divided by 3 times m Planck squared. So all I've done here is I've taken the expression for the radiation density, assuming that all this happens during radiation domination. So I plugged in the energy density here for radiation, and I've divided by 3 times m Planck squared. So 
roughly um, up to this g star, my h squared goes like t to the fourth over m Planck squared. Or if you want to do sort of quick and dirty approximations, h goes roughly like <coughs> t squared over m Planck. <coughs> so the upshot of this is I can now, I can take my h squared, which relates time to this, this quantity. So I can relate my time to temperature. And as long as g, g star is relatively constant, I can exchange t for big T. So what we're going to do is change the time variable into a temperature variable. And we're going to change the equation for n chi into an equation for y chi. So okay, I, I made a bit of a mess here. I should have taken a more board space, but I'll put a box around it. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I made, made a real mess. So, bad, bad back blackboard form. Okay. Okay, so, so now if I use this and, and I just do a change of variables, what I find is that I can rewrite this equation in terms of. Um, I can exchange my time variable for an x variable, which is m chi over t. And my master equation could be rewritten as an equation for the yield as a function of x, where x is m chi over t. And um, I think you do this on the homework, or you'll, you'll do it at some point yourself. So this is, the, um, this is the result of that change of variables. So this is the usual scattering cross-section. And remember, the scattering cross-section, we can rewrite it as a function of x. This is what we went through in our approximation in the last class. This is just uh, stuff with y chi's. Um, this s is the entropy density. And you have an expression for the entropy density over here, which I can rewrite as 2 pi squared over 45 g star s m chi cubed times x to the minus 3. So I can think of this entropy density as a function of s of, of x. I have an x here. This h of m chi equals t is just the value of the Hubble constant when the temperature is equal to the mass of the particle. So in other words, this thing is just my pi squared over 90, g star at um, x equals to 1, um, m chi to the fourth over m Planck squared. And then it, everything else just goes through in the same way. Now, there is one other thing we need uh, for our freeze-out calculation, and that is an expression for y chi equilibrium. And we know what this expression is because we know what n chi equilibrium is, and we know what s is in equilibrium. So I, I have the expression for, for, for the entropy density. Um, I can also write an expression for y chi equilibrium. And my y chi equilibrium, we're going to mostly need the form of the equilibrium value of y chi in the limit of, um, of large x. And that corresponds, so large x corresponds to the non-relativistic limit of chi when the temperature is, is below the mass. And what you get is 45 over 2 pi to the fourth pi over 8 to the 1 half g chi over g star s x to the 3 halves e to the minus x. So the e to the minus x is just the usual Boltzmann factor. So what we have here is a differential equation for here y chi a function of x. And here everything I've written, this is just a constant. This is a function of x. This I've written as a function of x. And this 
uh, is a function of x. So this is a known function of x, and we're solving for this. OK, so what we're going to do, um, what we're going to do is solve for the value of y chi as x goes to infinity. So x, go, x going to infinity corresponds to the temperature going to zero. And even though the temperature today isn't zero, the temperature today is so small, and the behavior of y chi going to large temperatures flattens out. This means that if we just, if, if instead of using um, x goes to a very big number, and just take x goes to infinity, we get a good approximation. So we're going to do that. And the way to solve this equation approximately, it's straightforward to do it numerically, but it's, it's, it's still useful to look at an approximate solution, is to keep in mind the form of this, of this little diagram. OK. So there are two steps in this approximation. Let me just remember myself what I want to do. OK. So our assumption, remember, is that the freeze out happens when the, the particle is non-relativistic. So our first step, let me just tinker with this. Our first step is going to be, our first step is going to be to estimate the value of x when it freezes out. So equivalently, this is the value of, of, of x at thermal freeze out corresponding to the, the freeze out temperature. And what we're going to do effectively is, is assume that um, for our approximate solution, we're going to find the freeze out temperature. And we're going to match up the value um, below the freeze out temperature to the equilibrium value above the freeze out temperature. So the first step is, um, is figuring out the freeze out temperature. And the freeze out temperature corresponds to a certain value uh, of x. And our estimate for this is going to be to solve for the value of x such that h of x is equal to sigma v, which is a function of x, times the equilibrium value times some constant. And it's some constant of order unity. So our first, our first step is to estimate where, what the freeze out temperature is. And this corresponds roughly to, to where it happens. So the point is that um, this term, when it beats out this term, drives me to equilibrium. As I start to depart from equilibrium, um, that corresponds to, to this term being about the same size as this term. And we're going, we're going to estimate the size of, of this term compared to this term by canceling off a factor of n chi on both sides and, um, and putting in a fudge factor k to, um, to account for maybe order one slot. So again, this is an approximate solution, but uh, it works pretty well. So again, we, we, we know what this is as a function of, of x. This is a constant. And this is some function of x that we determine by doing the, the QFT calculation. OK. And if we assume that sigma v, suppose, yes? Uh, so on the right-hand side, you have n chi squared minus n chi equilibrium squared, right? Yes. So I mean, knocking off n chi is, oh, what happens to the second term? OK, so, so, so I can write that last term yeah. as um, n chi minus n chi equilibrium times n chi plus n chi equilibrium. Right. And we're, we're going to assume that the deviation of n chi from n chi equilibrium is kind of order one. Right. So that means that we cancel off essentially one factor of n chi equilibrium on both sides. And the other side is it going to be some order one number times yes. n chi equilibrium with the signals. So, so that's essentially what we're doing here. So suppose this sigma v takes the form of some constant, or some, something that's independent of, of x times x to the minus n. So if you remember back to what we had, um, for n equals 0, this corresponds to an s wave annihilation. And for n equals 1, that's p wave. And we, we typically don't worry about stuff beyond that. And when you, when you take this, you plug it in here, you can solve iteratively for it. And the approximate solution um, is the freeze out temperature is a log. So here's my kappa. Um, I have some constant junk. 
Okay, so the stuff going in here is the same as the stuff in this big square bracket. So this is an approximate solution that I get by taking this form and essentially doing an, iter an iterative solution for x. Um, and in principle, there are higher terms, but the higher terms are all, all, all involve multiple logarithms. So the upshot of this is that this freeze out, this is some dimensionless quantity, it ends up being dominated by, by, by this first term. So this term, this first piece in the square bracket is typically a pretty big number. So it's a dimensionless number, but it, it turns out to be numerically typically very big. And the nice thing about logs is that even if I, I plug in a big, huge number here, the log makes that number not so big. Yes? So what is G star hop? Uh, well, this is the G star oh, I see. Um, for radiation. And I've just taken the one half power. Okay, so they did it. again, this is only an approximate iterative solution, but it works pretty well. This is the first correction to the leading iterative solution. And in principle, you could do higher order pieces, but they become less and less important. So for example, if this is a big number, this is a log of a big number, which isn't nearly as big. And this is a log of that not so big number. So you, you typically get a pretty good convergence. And it turns out that when you compare the solution, this approximate solution, to an actual numerical solution, you find that k of roughly n plus 1 um, works best. So our, our, our kind of slot factor kappa turns out to be, if you set kappa equal to n plus 1 for this kind of cross-section, you get a pretty good approximation of the actual numerical solution. Okay, so again, the specific form of this isn't so important, but this is still a useful formula, even though it's not entirely exact, because it lets you estimate the freeze-out temperature in a very quick way, um, for, in a very quick way from stuff that's, that's fairly easy to find. And one thing for self-consistency of this picture is that this x freeze-out should be um, larger than, than one. So remember, our implicit assumption is that the freeze-out is happening after the dark matter species has become non-relativistic, for this to be self-consistent, the freeze-out temperature should be smaller than the mass, and that corresponds to x larger than 1. So for, for the self-consistency of this whole picture, this quantity had better be larger than 1. Otherwise, our assumptions are no good, and, and you shouldn't be applying this approximation. OK. So this is the first step. The second step is to take our freeze-out temperature um, plug it back into our modified master equation and figure out what the number density is um, at very large x. <coughs> yes? So is there a sum over the n when you expand in, in the partial rate expansion? Should there be a sum? Oh, yeah. So in, in, general, so in general, I have multiple terms. Right. But, but usually because x turns out to be pretty big, yeah. uh, I, it's usually a pretty good approximation to only keep the, the, the leading term. So, 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 so this approximation is specifically for the case where I have where the cross section takes this form. More generally, the cross section will have um, a whole lot of different terms, um, but but in that case, in that case, you can still apply this approximation to the first kind of the biggest term. So there could be a case where we don't have an S rate, but we have a P rate. In that case, n is one. Yes. Okay. So just here. OK, so the thing we get with our x freeze out is that for x less than x freeze out, our approximation is that y chi is equal to y chi equilibrium to a good approximation. And now we want to transfer this over to the case of x greater than x freeze out. So in, in the case of x greater than freeze, x freeze out, we expect that our y chi it's going to be much larger than the equilibrium value. Because the equilibrium value is falling off exponentially, whereas our actual density is, is flattening out to some constant. And the upshot of that is now if we, if we go back and plug back into our uh, uh, equation here, um, 
I think I forgot to define something. Um, actually, hold on, let, me, let me just figure out where I am. Okay, I, I, I forgot to design, define something in, in, in my notes. Sorry about that. Let me just figure out what I am. Okay. Well, sorry. I, 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 I have a type in my notes, but I'll, I'll fix that up shortly. Um, if I drop the y chi equilibrium and I plug back in here, and just to be consistent with my notes, the thing I, I call y delta in my nodes is y chi minus y chi equilibrium. In this limit, this is roughly just y chi. If I take that and I plug back in here and I drop the equilibrium terms, what I find is d delta dx is equal to um, Minus, okay, sorry, I, I need to clean up my notes a little bit. I'll do that. Minus x to the n minus 2 times, there's a prefactor that the prefactor is a constant that I'm going to call lambda. So I factored out all the x's from the stuff in front of the sigma v. I've written the sigma v as sigma n x to the minus n. Um, the rest of the stuff that goes up in this expression, remember x is just x. The s here goes like, um, the, the, the S is the entropy density, and the entropy density goes like X to the minus 3. So that gives me a factor of X to the minus 2. And then I have a, bu a bunch of other constant stuff from that expression that I, I, I dump into here. So this, la this lambda is just a bunch of constants that you can derive from, for, from this expression, plugging in the, the expression for the density. So I get a minus 2 from the x times s. I get uh, an x to the minus n from my assumption about the form of the cross-section. And this side just gives me a factor of delta squared. So now, this is an easy differential equation to solve. And when I integrate this, and uh, in, in, when I integrate this and solve for the value at, um, when I integrate this and solve for the value at large, times, what I find is that my final y chi at t0, where t0 is the time today, is roughly n plus 1 times x freeze out to the n plus 1 divided by this constant lambda times sigma n. And I can take this and I, I can take this and convert this into an, an expression. I think I forgot to print out the last page. I can take this and plug it into an expression for the dark matter density today. So remember, um, y chi um, is basically constant. After freeze out. And the upshot of that is that to get the to, to get the number density n chi today, the, the number density n chi today is just going to be the entropy density today times my calculation for y chi. And this entropy density today, um, unfortunately I, I didn't write it down, but this, this, is, an, this is a known quantity that um, appears on the page of my notes that I forgot to print out. And this is a known quantity, so this is a known number. And I can also convert this into the, um, in, into the dark matter fraction. So remember the dark matter fraction, and this is, and this is the thing that, um, for example, the, the Planck satellite just measured. This is the, the fraction of the energy density of the universe times this little h squared. This thing is just going to be m chi, the dark matter mass, times the dark matter number density, today, divided by rho c. And this is the critical density. 
and this and this critical density is just another known number. It's it's something like um, ten to the minus forty seven uh, GeV to the fourth. So the, the point is that now with this approximate solution, um, if I know how to compute my cross section and I know how to compute my freeze out temperature, I can take this, plug in a bunch of numbers, and find what the dark matter energy fraction is today. And actually, sorry, I, there should be a factor of h squared here. So what I have here, and I'll talk more about it in a specific example in a couple minutes, is an approximate solution of the freeze out equations that lets me estimate the final dark matter relic density today. So from this first expression, I, I, I can figure out the freeze out temperature. For it to be self-consistent, it has to be much larger than, my, my x freeze out has to be much larger than one. But provided it is, I can plug it back in to this, to this expression. And this expression has a bunch of constants in, in this and that. I'll rewrite this in a slightly nicer form in a second. And what I get is a simple expression for the dark matter density today. So a bunch of stuff has gone into this. Uh, I have some particle physics in the form of computing the sigma v. And you know how to compute that from, 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 your, from your QFT course and your standard model course. Um, the rest of the stuff is a bunch of uh, cosmology junk. And I have all kinds of stuff. I've got like the, the Planck mass. I've got uh, numbers of degrees of freedom. Um, I've got the critical density and all, all this stuff. But all this stuff gets wrapped into just a single number that I can compare to experiment. That. <clears throat> So now that I have this formula, I can um, I can recast it in a um, I can recast it in a slightly different form, and after recasting it, I can start to look at specific particle physics theories that could um, that they could potentially explain the dark matter. So once I have this expression, I can now look at specific uh, specific proposals for new particles beyond the standard model that they could make up this dark matter. They could make up this chi particle. I can, go, I can now sit down, estimate the cross-section, and see if they actually make sense. So this brings me to the next thing I want to cover, which are things called WIMPs. And WIMPs stand for a weakly interacting massive particle. And WIMPs are by far the most popular candidate for the dark matter. So the dark matter doesn't have to be a WIMP, but th th this is the one that seems the most likely, at least from um, this, the theory side of things, and it's the one that's been studied uh, the most in depth. So it's, it, it's worth, to, if you want to follow the dark matter literature, you should be familiar with, with what WIMPs are and where they might come from. So the neat thing, um, the neat thing about WIMPs is that we can estimate their annihilation cross-section fairly straightforwardly. And we can do this by just very crude dimensional analysis. So one thing I always recommend doing, before you actually do a hard, specific calculation, always try to make an estimate based on dimensional analysis, just to get a rough idea of what your answer should be, more or less. So this is a scattering cross-section. And a scattering cross-section has dimensions of area. So area corresponds to 1 over mass squared in my natural units. And that means that if I think about the stuff that can go into this, I know that it has to have dimensions of 1 over mass squared. And I can also think, of, I also think about the stuff that would go into computing this cross-section. And the stuff that goes into computing this cross-section will be something like, for example, suppose I have, um, su su suppose I have some... Um, Here's one kind of thing that could contribute. I could have some chi, chi going to, for example, Z, if the chi's have a weak interaction, and the Z then goes to FF bar. So this is one kind of cross-section that can contribute, or I could have other kinds of cross-sections. But the upshot of that is that the biggest dimensionful scale in this picture is the dark matter mass. And since the dark matter particles um, are colliding relatively slowly, um, the, the, the dark matter 
particle mass is much larger than the temperature and freeze out, that means that the, the typical momentum going through this Z propagator is going to be set by the dark matter mass. So the biggest dimensionable quantity is going to be the, the dark matter mass. So that means that this quantity should go roughly like um, the dimensionable quantity that, that, that goes in the denominator that's going to make up the mass dimensions will be the dark matter mass. So 1 over n squared. And then I have other factors coming from um, couplings. So for a typical interaction like this, or more generally, if this is a weak interaction, I'm going to have one, two weak interaction vertices in each amplitude, and I square the thing to get the matrix element. So that, that means that I'm going to have something like four powers of the weak coupling, and I'm going to put in a factor of one over four pi, just because that's what I usually get when I compute cross sections. It corresponds to, it corresponds to the phase space. Um, but you can leave it out if, if, if you don't want to put the four pi, but I, I should count the number of couplings and the, the masses. And remember, this coupling corresponds to the weak coupling. And numerically, um, it's about 0 0.6. So the value of the weak coupling, the fundamental coupling constant for the weak interaction is about 0.6. And I can take this approximation and rewrite it as a number. And that number is something like 1.7 times 10 to the minus 23 centimeters cubed per second, plugging in numbers, times 100 GeV over m chi. So I just plugged in numbers to my, to my, to my very crude estimate. Now, the thing is, if I take this estimate, and I plug it into this formula and that formula, what I find is numbers that, 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 um, that, 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 that actually look pretty good. So it turns out that my x at freeze out is about, um, is about 27. So this is safely larger than 1. Just a second. And I also find my dark matter density um, to be about 0 0.0002. So this is a bit small, but remember the observed value is about 0.1, so this isn't too, too bad. Sorry, you had a question? Um, so in, in the argument for uh, estimating that cross-section, um, so, so I can understand that the mass of the dark matter is the large scale. Mm -hmm. but I don't see why it makes sense then to put it in the denominator because that would make it a small number, right? So, for example, take one over at the mass of z squared. That would be big, that would be a bigger contribution than that. Like, I can, like, I don't see how we see that we expect that that form. Okay. Of mass being big. Yeah. Well, so, so okay. So, so, so first of all, this this is a very very rough approximation. So the actual answer is something you should compute. But uh, I just want to get get a ballpark picture. Um, here, if I, here, suppose my dark matter mass is much, much larger than the, than the, than the Z mass. In that case, the momentum going through this propagator is going to be, um, the momentum going through this propagator is going to be much, much larger than the, than the Z mass. So in, in that case, the propagator here would look like 1 over essentially, um, it would be 4 m chi squared minus m Z squared. And this piece, if it's much bigger than m Z, is, will completely beat it out. Now, I can, have, I, I can start to have something more interesting happen if 4m chi squared starts to become similar to mz, but I'll worry about that later. For now, I just want to do kind of a rough ballpark estimate. So what I get from, from all this hand waving, and it really is hand waving, I, I'm just trying to get a very, very rough estimate, is I, I, I do find that for a weak size cross section, I get, um, I get non relativistic freeze out. So my approximations are self consistent. And I also get a value for the dark matter density that is not that far off from the Azure value. So it is three orders of magnitude too small. But if, if I think about all the junk that went into this estimate, um, here I'm computing stuff very roughly from, from particle physics. Um, here I have stuff like, if you go through all the expressions, I have the value of the Hubble constant today, the critical density today. Um, I have all this stuff going on. And given that this is actually as close as it is to the observed value is a bit of a minor miracle. It could have been orders and orders of magnitude different. So the fact that this is not too bad compared to the observation 
is sometimes called the WIMP miracle. So it might not seem entirely miraculous to you at the moment, but the sort of the backstory on this is that we also have lots of other reasons to expect new particles and new interactions at about the weak scale. So for those of you that took the, 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 the Beyond the Standard Model course, um, one thing it turns out is that if you take the standard model and you try to extrapolate it up to very high energies, um, something goes bad. And the thing that goes bad is that the energy scale associated with uh, electroweak symmetry breaking, corresponding to the masses of the, the W and Z vector bosons, that mass scale gets destabilized by quantum corrections. And from that point of view, um, it seems like it's a bit of a puzzle why the weak scale has the value it does and isn't either zero or something really, really big. So to solve this, people have, put it, people have suggested all kinds of extensions of the standard model, so-called BSM, beyond the standard model. And typically, to save the weak scale, those extensions of the standard model, the new particles should also come in with masses not too far from the weak scale. So based on this quantum stability of the weak scale argument, we expect new physics near the weak scale. And it's kind of neat that this new physics also gives us the right, at least within a ballpark estimate, the right dark matter density. So people call this the weak miracle. Um, you, you, you can go off and argue about just how miraculous it is, but it, it is at least a, a seeming accident that the motivation for these particles with possibly weak interactions, talking to the standard model to save the weak scale, give roughly, in the right ballpark, the right dark matter relic density. Yes? So what is the value of h squared again? Okay, so... Uh, just to remind you, H is the value of the Hubble constant today, in units of um, 100 kilometers per second per I think, megaparsec. So the, the, the measured value of H is roughly 0 0.7. So the H squared is, is a factor of one half. Um, the, 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 the other thing is, when I normalize the critical density, um, we know that the, the, the total density of stuff today is equal to the critical density within error bars. And that means that, um, that means that if I sum over all the contributions to the energy density, um, if I sum over the, all, all the individual contributions to the energy density, I should get basically one. So if, if, if you like, um, up to this h squared factor, the the, the, the point 0.1 that is measured, the point 0.1 value that's observed, um, corresponds to roughly 20% uh, of the universe consisting of dark matter in terms of energy density. Okay. So in, in any case, um, I have this Wimp miracle. And in passing, let me also give you a, a second handy rule of thumb if, 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 when you go and estimate your cross-sections. And that, that other second handy rule of thumb, which again, it, it's only a rule of thumb, it's, it's, a, it's only an approximation, is that the relic density that you're going to get today from a weak scale cross-section with the value of the, the freeze-out x um, of about sort of 20 to 30, the value you, you, you get today is basically the observed value for an annihilation cross-section times 3 times 10 to minus 26 centimeters cubed per second um, over sigma v. So this is actually a handy mnemonic because um, instead of going through the whole relic density calculation, um, the relic density calculation in a sense has been done for you. And if you want to get a quick estimate, um, if you want to estimate very quickly whether your theory gives about the right, right, right dark matter relic density, you can just compute the value of sigma v. And specifically, this is the value of sigma v um, at, at, at freeze out. And convert it into centimeters cubed per second units. And you should get a value of about 3 times 10 to the minus 26 if you want to get the right relic density. So again, this is just a, 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 a quick way to estimate whether your theory works in terms of getting the right relic density. Yes? How, how do you get the number 3 times 10 to the minus 26? Where did the number come from? Oh, so the, 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 
so, so the 3 times 10 to the minus 26 just happens to be the value that um, if I plug it into if I plug it into my equation up there using the result over there, I get the right number. So I'm, I'm just plugging in numbers, and it, it, this just happens to be the value of, of, of sigma, roughly sigma n for x equals to 0 that gives me the right relative density. So, 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 so it's just a matter of plugging in numbers. So there, there's nothing deep about it. And well, I, I, I guess the, 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 the other thing is when I talk about sigma v, what you usually do when you compute it is just find some particle physics thing. And the particle physics thing, for example, if I look at this expression, um, this expression is going to have units of g v to the minus 2. So g v to the minus 2, I can convert that to units of centimeters squared because uh, 1 over GeV corresponds to a centimeter up to a conversion factor. And then I can multiply it by centimeters per second, which is, um, which is dimensionless because I've set C equals to 1. And when I do all those conversions, I, I take my 1 over GeV squared quantity and I turn it into something with units of centimeters cubed per second. So in my natural units where I set H bar and C and the Boltzmann constant equal to 1, um, this centimeters cubed per second is equivalent to 1 over GeV. The actual number you get depends on the conversion factors, but it's just a matter of using different units. So it's, 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 it's like measuring, it's like, it's like saying like this distance is 1 meter, or it's like 3 feet 3 inches, or what have you. I get a different number, but, my, but the different number just correspond to different units. So this number is, is, is a certain choice of units. Okay. So this, this, this WIMP story is, is very enticing, and a lot of attempts to write down dark matter, to write down theories of dark matter, are based on, on this WIMP idea, the fact that WIMPs do give you roughly the right relative density. So I want to spend a, a little bit of time talking about popular WIMP candidates. And there, there are lots of them. But I'm going to cover the, the two cases that have been um, uh, studied the, the most extensively. And the first case is uh, supersymmetry. Or um, Susie for short. OK. So some of you, I think, have taken B, the BM, BSM course. Uh, others haven't. But if you haven't, don't worry. I'll, I'll try to make this self-contained. Um, supersymmetry is a kind of symmetry that extends the usual space-time symmetries. So if you think back, to, if you think of your, your flat space-time, your flat space-time is invariant under um, time translations, it's invariant under spatial translations, and it's also invariant under rotations and Lorentz boosts. And all of those operations together um, fit into a single when you, when you combine all those operations together, you get a, a larger group of transformations that is the, the, the total transformation group of flat space-time. And that group is called um, the Poincaré group. Now, what supersymmetry is, is an extension of the Poincaré group. Now, you may or may not have covered this in your, your quantum field theory course. But, but if I take as a starting point that my theory of elementary particles should be invariant under this Poincaré symmetry, it should be consistent with the symmetries of flat space-time, um, that means that the individual quantities in my theory should have well-defined transformation properties under the Poincaré group. And when you define that, um, the, the objects that have the, those well-defined properties under the Poincaré group um, it turns out that those correspond to things called representations of the Poincaré group. And if I look at the representations of the Poincaré group, what I find are that these objects correspond to particles with definite mass and definite spin. So if you like, the idea of particle mass and the idea of particle spin comes out of the fact that I'm imposing this underlying Poincaré symmetry. Now, what supersymmetry does is it extends this Poincaré symmetry. And by extending the Poincaré symmetry, what it does effectively is that it relates particles with one spin to particles with a different spin, but the same mass. So we want to apply supersymmetry to the standard model. And the implication of supersymmetry to the standard model is that for every standard model particle, 
I should be able to apply a supersymmetry transformation to that particle and connect to a different particle with the same properties, the same mass, the same um, couplings, but with a different spin. So when I apply this to the standard model, what I find is that for each standard model fermion, and the fermion, I mean specifically a spin one half object, I'll call this F, this should correspond to something with a different spin, and this thing with a different spin, I call this a fermion, and it turns out that in the minimal case, this thing should have spin zero. So when I apply supersymmetry to the standard model, um, for my total theory to be supersymmetric, that means that for every fermion with spin one half, like a top quark or an electron, I should have a corresponding scalar boson particle with spin one half that I call a fermion. So for example, for the top quark, I have a particle called the stop. For the electron, I have a particle called the selectron and so on. So every standard model particle should have the same, should, should have a, a partner with spin zero. The standard model also has gauge bosons. And the gauge bosons have spin um, essentially one. And corresponding to that, imposing supersymmetry, I get objects with spin one half that I call gauginos. And this object has spin one half. And finally, the, other, the last set of objects um, in the standard model are the scalars, and specifically the Higgs scalars. And the Higgs scalars have spin zero. And for every Higgs, I should have a corresponding partner that I'll put a tilde on, and I call this a Higgsino. And it has spin one half. So if I extend the standard model to include supersymmetry, um, that means for all the standard model particles, I expect to have these partner particles with different spins. And it's going to turn out that these partner particles um, well, there are things we can go and look for at particle collider experiments, but some, of, some combinations of these partner particles can also be the dark matter, can be archi. Okay. I think I have another board. Yes. I, I know that one argument for supersymmetry has to do with uh, mass sequence calculations uh, and, and calculations, but I was wondering, is there also a theoretical reason to, ex to expect such an extension on the Poincaré principle? Or is it just something that happens to be equivalent to what you want to get? Yeah, well, so, so, so there are different motivations for supersymmetry. Yeah, um, yeah and related to this. Yeah, so, so, so on, on the sort of phenomenological side, one of the motivations, as I said, is supersymmetry, it turns out, can stabilize the weak scale against quantum reactions. Um, we're going to see in a second that supersymmetry also gives a very nice candidate for dark matter. So, that, so that's good. Um, if you want to take kind of a, a more fundamental physics approach, um, a lot of our attempts to, to apply quantum mechanics to gravity, um, w w w one of our leading candidates for that is, is, is string theory. And the only way we know how to make sense of string theory is, is if we have a lot of supersymmetry in the theory. So based on what we know about string theory, we also expect to have supersymmetry at some point. Now, that supersymmetry might be broken at a very high energy, and it might not last down to low energies that we, that we need to see it. I'll come back to this in a second. Um, but there, there is this fundamental physics re reason that in a lot of attempts to quantize gravity, supersymmetry seems to be a necessary tool. Um, one other thing that, that's kind of interesting is that if I take the Poincaré symmetries and I look at all the ways I can possibly extend it, supersymmetry is the maximal extension. So if you take the point of view that if I see one symmetry, it should be extended as, as, as far as possible, supersymmetry is as far as you can extend it. There are actually, you know, there are actually theorems about it, it being essentially the only case. Yes? Is it important for our, uh, for our uh, case here that the Higgs has to have spin transfer to Higgs? Or, um, or dark matter, is that important? Uh, not, not specifically. But uh, yeah, I, I, I might mention that in, in, in a second, but it's, it's, it's not essential. The other Higgs could not be a dark matter. It would be a um, no, it, 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 it's what, whether you have one, one Higgs or, or two, it doesn't matter for the, for the dark matter story. Yeah. 
So, so, so just very quickly, what, what supersymmetry does is suppose I have, um, so, so the stability of, of the weak scale, the thing that sets the size of the weak scale is the Higgs boson. And the Higgs boson gets contributions, the Higgs boson gets contributions to its mass from loops of particles. So, so, so here's a loop of a particle. And there, there, there are different ways to handle this, but um, this is a, a divergent loop. And this gives me a correction to um, delta mh squared that goes like um, the coupling. So I'm going to call the coupling g psi squared over 4 pi squared. Um, actually, I think there's a minus sign here. Times, depending on how I treat this, um, roughly it goes like the mass squared of this particle. So suppose there exists Suppose there exists some heavy particle with an order one coupling to the Higgs, um, with, with an order one coupling to the Higgs that um, with, with has a heavy mass. That means that the size of this correction to the, the, the Higgs is going to be really big. And it's going to have to cancel off against other stuff. But we know numerically that this mh squared should be about the size of the W and Z boson masses. So this delta, the, the total mh squared should be roughly 100 GeV squared. So it's, it seems weird to have a physical quantity that should be 100 GeV squared getting contributions from stuff that can be much, much heavier. What supersymmetry does is for each particle, here I've drawn a fermion particle, for each particle like this, there's a corresponding superpartner particle. Um, there's a corresponding superpartner particle, and I guess they're, I'll draw this way. So for example, if this is a fermion, there's a corresponding scalar particle that contributes a second loop. And the second loop has an opposite sign because remember, fermion loops get a minus one. Boson loops don't have that. And this extra contribution, in the limit of exact supersymmetry, has the same value, but the opposite sign. So what happens in it, with exact supersymmetry is that this correction is canceled against this correction and this thing that would destabilize the weak scale is, is canceled off by this. So supersymmetry protects my weak scale by giving this cancellation. So this is the motivation for supersymmetry. Now, this picture technically only applies when I have exact supersymmetry. And exact supersymmetry is actually very restrictive. Exact supersymmetry implies two things. Um, exact supersymmetry implies that these couplings should be exactly the same. And it also implies that these masses should be exactly the same. So now, if I apply this to the standard model partners, uh, standard model par 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 particles and partners, this means that, for example, for every electron, I should have a scalar electron with the same charge and the same mass. And we definitely, definitely don't see this. So this means that supersymmetry can't be an exact symmetry of nature, but supersymmetry could still be an approximate symmetry of nature. And what I mean by approximate, is that um, what, I mean, what, what I mean by approximate is that suppose, suppose I, I put in operators into my Lagrangian for the theory that don't respect supersymmetry, but where all these operators have um, a positive mass dimension associated with them. And, and, and what I mean by that is I write new terms in my Lagrangian where all of these terms come in with a mass dimension. So, so for example, a, a mass term or a trilinear coupling with a positive mass dimension. And the reason this is good is that um, in this approximate supersymmetry, because all the supersymmetry breaking effects are associated with some mass scale, um, the upshot of this is that Susie becomes asymptotically, asymptotically exact at very high energies. So what we can do is, treat, is, is, is impose supersymmetry on standard model, but in this approximate sense. And this approximate sense corresponds to breaking supersymmetry by these so-called soft terms. And soft here just means that all the terms that break supersymmetry come in with, with, with some mass piece. 
And at energies much larger than the, the, than the soft mass, um, I, I, I regain the full supersymmetry of the theory. Now, if I go back to this cancellation, when I go back to this cancellation, instead of having this mass for, um, for the correction, this superpartner now picks up a soft contribution too. So what, what I would get in this approximate supersymmetry case is instead of having m psi squared, I would have m psi squared, where m psi is the mass of the fermion, plus a correction from the soft term to the mass. So the upshot of that is the total mass squared is now the sum of these two things. And I can make my superpartners heavier with this approximate supersymmetry picture. But now, when I cancel these two things against each other, what I find is that, um, it, 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 is that the net correction is, is, is g psi squared over 4 pi squared m soft squared. And this approximation still holds as the, as the mass psi goes to infinity. So the nice thing about this is that if I put in supersymmetry, but even approximate supersymmetry, where the approximate supersymmetry has a special property where all the breaking is associated with this dimensionful coupling, that means that I still get a cancellation between these two terms of, of the m psi pieces, but, but I lack the cancellation of the soft piece. Now, again, remember this thing should be about 100 GeV squared. So numerically, this thing is not crazy big as long as m soft is less than about 1,000 GeV because this loop, this loop factor is about 110, or I should say 110 squared. So the upshot of this is that for supersymmetry to protect the weak scale, what we want is for supersymmetry to be roughly an approximate symmetry, but with um, specifically m soft less than about 1,000 GeV. And the implication of this is that these terms, these m soft breaking terms, also correspond to mass of the superpartners. So the, the, the whole story, the, 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 the net story, is that I, I have supersymmetry. It's softly broken, so it's, it's approximate. But it's, softly, it's broken in a way that has a positive mass dimension. And this is nice because as long as the breaking isn't too big numerically, I still stabilize the weak scale in an appropriate way. And this also tells me what the masses of my superpartners have to be. I mean, in principle, values smaller than about 1,000 GeV could be cons well, will be just fine with the cancellation. But on the other hand, uh, I would have seen them before if they're much smaller than that. So we have this, on the one hand, a phenom phenomenological limit that the soft mass should be, should be not much smaller than 1,000 GeV. But it should also not be too much bigger if I want to get this cancellation to work right. So I'll wrap it up there. I've gone a little bit over, over time, I'm sorry. But uh, come back, I guess, on Monday, and we can talk more about how supersymmetry gives a very nice dark matter candidate. Yes? So all, introducing all the superpartners, doesn't, doesn't it screw up our, like, the, the thermal history of the universe? Yeah. Or... Well, it, it's going to change it. But typically, these superpartners are going to equil equilibrate at high, at, high, at high temperatures. Right. And, and what's going to happen is that there'll be a lightest superpartner, and we're going to arrange for that lightest superpartner to be stable, and that's going to be our dark matter. So in this case, messing up the cosmological history is actually doing what we want. Okay. It's giving us dark matter.